good evening and welcome to the great Mayday Cabaret coming to you from the Stand Comedy Club here in Edinburgh. We have a fantastic show for you this evening. Oh, such excitement we have for you this evening. This is a close set, by the way. We're all sealed in with any luck. We will never get out until the shops are all open again. Yay! But I'm trying not to think about that too much. Welcome to our fabulous show. We have a great, great, a wonderful, wonderful series of performers for you this evening. To take your mind off uh, the bank holiday, I'm not sure what you're thinking of the weather, but it's probably traditionally British. Uh, we're going to have fun, games, songs, excitement. We're going to have poetry and we're going to have comedy. And we're going to have all such a lovely evening. It's going to be just joyous. I'm so glad that you could join us and take your mind off. The election, because there is an election going on, and this is when I miss my late cat, Sully. My cat, Sully, was wonderful. He liked to pee on the post, and he was particularly fond of a Tory party leaflet. And let me tell you, when the Conservatives landed on the mat, that cat could produce enough urine to float our vote clear to the kitchen. <laughs> It was marvellous, it was marvellous. And um, there's also another leaf that, that arrived on my mat that I was quite surprised about. You may have heard of them. It's the Scottish Family Party, which for a, a brief, I knew, <laughs> for a brief second I thought it was a KTL compilation LP for a glued Glasgow hug Minet. But no, this is not so much a uh, sort of a compilation LP as I can't believe I'm not a Presbyterian. Because... <laughs> Seriously grim, seriously grim, seriously grim. This is the old brand of politics. And rather wonderfully, very keen on, on families, as the name would suggest, the Scottish Family Party. Not so keen on how they're made. <laughs> <laughs> Amongst other things, it would seem, they have sworn to protect our children from sex education classes, which they say are vulgar and corrupting. And rather disappointingly, they don't list where these classes are. <laughs> so if there's anyone out there running a vulgar and corrupting sex education class, could you please give me a call? There may still be a few tips that this old horse has yet to learn. So, <laughs> old mare like me. I know, I'm very old. And our guests this, uh, this evening are, 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 are just fantastic. And, and youth springs from our first fantastic contributor, our first comrade, first great comrade to join us, a great singer, songwriter, a great performer, an absolutely wonderful, all-round fantastic young man. Let's go well now for the fabulous Callum Beard! <laughs> Hello everyone, I hope you're all well and have enjoyed the May Day weekend. Thank you for that very, very nice and touching introduction, Susan. I hope that my uh, first song can live up to that intro. Thank you. And this first song I'm going to do for you tonight is a tribute to the great Victor Hara, the great socialist singer-songwriter from Chile. Victor Hara of Chile Lived like a shooting star He fought for the people of Chile With his songs and his guitar His hands were gentle His hands were strong Victor was a peasant boy Barely six years old When he sat upon his father's plow and watch the earth unfold His hands were gentle His hands were strong When the neighbours had a wedding Or one of their children died His mother sang all night for them With Victor by her side Her hands were gentle Her hands were strong he grew up to be a fighter He stood against what was wrong He learned of people's grief and joy And turned it into song His hands were gentle His hands were strong He sang for the copper miners And those who farmed the land When he sang for the factory workers They knew Victor was their man his hands were gentle, 
his hands were strong. He campaigned for a yendi, and he canvassed night and day, singing, take hold of your comrade's hand, the future starts today. His hands were gentle, his hands were strong. When Pinochet took Chile, they arrested Victor then and caged him in the stadium with 5,000 frightened men. His hands were gentle, his hands were strong. Victor picked up his guitar, his voice resounded strong. He sang there for his comrades till the guards cut short his song. His hands were gentle, his hands were strong. They broke the bones in both his hands, beat him on the head, tortured him with electric wires, and then they shot him dead. His hands were gentle, his hands were strong. Victor had of Chile, he lived like a shooting star. He fought for the people of Chile with his songs and his guitar. His hands were gentle, his hands were strong. His hands were gentle, his hands were strong. Thank you, comrades. Cheers. Cheers. Hello, oh, and thank you there, Callum. Once again, a timely reminder of where we come from, how to stay together, why we should all remain together. Solidarity is an important thing. Unions are important things. Thank you to Unite Unison for sponsoring this fantastic event. And now we're going to move on for some comedy. Let's hear it for the comedy! I'm really pleased because this is a great pal of mine, a great pal of yours. Please go wild now for the incredible Vladimir McTavish! Evening, comrades. Uh, May Day greetings as we emerge from the pandemic into a bizarre parallel universe where Dominic Cummings judges people's integrity and honesty. <laughs> In much the same way as Amanda Holden judges talent. So, <laughs> so it's been a weird year and a bit. Um, at times it's felt a bit like Groundhog Day, but then I realised I've thought that the day before, and the day before that, and the day before that. So, in case anyone hasn't been paying attention, here's a quick rundown of the highlights of the last 14 months. In March 2020, a bunch of posh yards come back from a skiing holiday in Italy, bringing a deadly virus with them that infects and kills 100,000 people in the UK, most of whom could never have afforded to go skiing themselves. Boris Johnson says there's nothing to see here, no cause for panic, no reason for pubs to shut, and he himself intends to get to the bottom of the toilet roll crisis. <laughs> Boris Johnson then decides there is a reason for pubs to shut, but promises to get coronavirus packing within 12 weeks. In April, Boris Johnson fulfills a pledge made four years previously on the side of a bus to raise more money for the NHS. He does this by making a 99-year-old man walk endlessly around his own back garden. In May, having failed to send coronavirus packing, Boris Johnson decides the only way out of the hole he's dug is to pretend to be infected himself. 
Medical experts say it's impossible to tell whether the Prime Minister has COVID or not, as he's permanently sweaty, out of breath and lacking any sense of taste. <laughs> also in May, Dominic Cummings drives down a busy motorway to test his eyesight. When asked if he himself had then ever done anything similar, former Home Secretary David Blunkett is unavailable for comment. <laughs> in June, as the death toll reaches 50,000, Boris Johnson decides it's time to reopen pubs in England, while there are still enough potential customers alive. <laughs> in July, <laughs> Chancellor Rishi Sunak doles out hundreds and millions of £10 meal vouchers, encouraging people to pack into busy pubs and restaurants, giving a very much needed kickstart to the second wave of the pandemic. <laughs> In September, Boris Johnson decides that pubs are actually very dangerous places, unless food is available. <laughs> this leads to a debate in Cabinet about what actually constitutes a substantial meal. Michael Gove says it could be a pasty. Matt Hancock insists it had to be at least a pasty and chips. This gives rise to a misconception that chips are actually an antidote to COVID. In October, COVID denier Donald Trump catches COVID, <laughs> but refuses to self-isolate. In November, COVID denier Donald Trump is voted out of office, but refuses to leave the White House, thereby ironically self-isolating more than he did when he was actually infected with the virus. <laughs> Trump refuses to concede defeat and spends his time on the golf course. So, very much like Adolf Hitler, his career comes to an end in a bunker. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> in December, the vaccine rollout is, uh, starts. Matt Hancock says he will quite gladly take the vaccine live in TV. However, he has talked out of this when it suggested this could lead to other cabinet ministers involved in similarly pointless stunts, such as Boris Johnson getting a prostate exam live in TV, Jacob Rees-Mogg getting a vasectomy, not before time, <laughs> live on TV. Batshit conspiracy theories abound about the vaccine. One of them suggests the vaccine may contain chips. <laughs> Matt Hancock says this proves the vaccine can be considered a substantial meal. <laughs> in January, there are revelations in the press that friends of Dominic Cummings have been awarded millions of pounds in COVID-related government contracts. The only thing surprising about these revelations is the revelation that Dominic Cummings has friends. <laughs> also in January, Joe Biden is, uh, nom is inaugurated. That is the right word. <laughs> he was elected, but he was later inaugurated. <laughs> As the President of the USA, Donald Trump refuses to attend the inauguration, the first time in over 50 years that a former president hasn't been present for the swearing in of his successor. The last time it happened was the inauguration of Lyndon Johnson, and JFK had a pretty watertight excuse for not being at that one. <laughs> in February, the UK death toll reaches 125,000. When someone points out this is roughly the same as the population of Blackburn, Matt Hancock says, well, when they spin the figures like that, they don't sound quite so bad after all. <laughs> in March, we approach the first anniversary of lockdown back in lockdown. Some people are tempted to say it feels a bit like Groundhog Day. <laughs> but then they realize they've been saying that for the previous 12 months. In April, the death of a 99-year-old man receives blanket 24-hour news coverage on the BBC. When it's calculated that if the same attention was given to every victim of COVID, the broadcast would have lasted roughly 348 years. <laughs> also in April, it is revealed that Boris Johnson ranted and shouted he'd rather see bodies piling up in the street than order a second lockdown which seems a rather strange way of reopening the economy. <laughs> Not much point in Primark being open if there are corpses outside the front door. 
in May, a crowdfunding page to refurbish Boris Johnson's flat using the same cladding as Grenfell Tower <laughs> receives £5 million in the first two hours. As the cash for curtain scandal rumbles on, Boris Johnson says, there's nothing to see here. No need to panic. But we've heard that quite a lot in the last 14 months, and quite frankly, it just feels like Groundhog Day all over again. <laughs> Have a great evening. Thank you very much. Stay safe. Good night. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> ah, hey, comrade. Well done. Also, I noticed... He's getting his hair cut somewhere, and I want to know how he's doing that. Is it that thing that George Clooney uses, that vibro thingy? Is that, was that, is that how you did it, Paul? Vladimir, did you get cut your hair with that? Oh, no, I, I actually got this done, believe it or not, uh, by a barber. <laughs> really? Pass his name on so I can avoid that. <laughs> And I don't know if you've been lucky enough to be one of the people who've been jagged yet. I know you've been jagged. I'm glad you've been jagged. I've been jagged. When I got jagged, it was rather wonderful. I went in and the nurse came up and said, it's AstraZeneca, is that okay? <laughs> like, it showed me it like it was going, no, no, sorry, I think that's court. Send it back. I want the fight, sir. Thanks very much. My mother has been done twice. She's very worried. She has heard on the grapevine, and by the grapevine, I mean all the old people that are walking around the park, that it could make her infertile. <laughs> She's 81. So she's not worried, but the woman next door who fancies a toy boy, he's 75, she's very worried, but she's 83. So things should be okay. You heard him earlier on. Let's get the applause going again. Let's go well once more for the wonderful Callum Bayard. Hello again. And this next song I'm going to do for you is one of my own. <clears throat> and it's based on a quote by the American singer-songwriter uh, Woody Guthrie, activist, all-round good guy. And he said he'd like to see every soldier in the world sit down at the side of the road, take off their guns, put down their bombs, and uh, talk to each other instead of shooting each other. And so I wrote this song imagining what that conversation would sound like between two soldiers. And this is called The Everwilling Soldier. I travel the world with my pack and my gun I've taken in the rain and I've taken in the sun I've seen deserts and sand dunes, rivers and trees And I brought native towns down to the And I do it for democracy, I do it for the oil I do it for freedom and a share of the spoils And I do it for hope and I do it for free thoughts I do it cause it's what I've helped empires rise and I toppled them too And I shot men no different to me and to you And I put an end to peace and I kick-started war I've taken a thousand orders no matter what for Oh, and I was there when the Tsar heard the curtain call And I flew the plane over Syria as the bombs began to fall But it was my blood spilled in the fields And when the battle cries, humanity yields
like every toy I'm tied to the game The war is my ball and the market is my chain I'm a never willing soldier no longer young and getting older and One of these days I'll be in of graves Thank you very much. Cheers. Thank you. Ah, thank you once again, Callum. More songs later. Well, another song later from Callum later on in the show. We promised you comedy. We promised you music. We promised you poetry. And we are delighted now to welcome to our stage poet, spoken word activist, Victoria McNulty. Thank you. I was bathed in a Sandinista tear, then birthed in a pool of hope over fear, and I was shaped like some suffragette that was fresh from a horse fight. I pound pavements marred as car bombs and marched with my collar starched by Marx and the syndicalists who were stricken beneath olive branches. My branch begins at Barrowlands etches its way east opposite river mouths towards red roads and sight hills where I'm bouldered by rubble and watched by the watchful. So I'll shed a tear for our tearful and in my youth we'd meld masonettes with ashtray stolen cigarettes, swings and monkey bars and burned out frames, games of Kirby beneath sodium streetlights. And now the scheme in my dream Rests in my mouth and fizzles and pallets murmured by shame, ineducation and rudimentary Gaelic. So one day when the air is thick and the East End is slick like some mafia back home or straight walls and vintage stalls and falafel. <laughs> I'll imagine this place in our Thatcherite grey with some bleary apprehension and I will never be able to celebrate her at all. So I'm just going to do uh, some poems about Glasgow today. Uh, this next one, it's just, I thought I would do it because the pubs are now open. Um, yay! <laughs> so a few years ago, I, um, I asked my pal if he wanted to come as a plus one to a music festival, and I just made these response into a found poem. Thanks for that, by the way. So I'm in lunches, you know, lunches? I know lunches. So anyway, he's stoning at the bar in these bogging hippie trousers like he's been on some gap year and then shot himself on the flight home. <laughs> and he's like, I'm sorry, do you have the Wi-Fi password? And lunches? I lunches, you know lunches? I, of course, I know lunches. So he says, mate. He leans into me, this binge drinking dentist, eyebrows poised to extract molars with disbelieving mouths. A pound rattles some Aztec camera on the jukebox overhead, but it's just me and him, rough and rotten, in this stout Formica stench. He says, mate, I think you must be fucking lost. Thank you. So, um, I don't know, this, this poem's, um, I wrote a poem a few years ago that another poet, I wouldn't say she copied it, but it was very similar to. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, 
And when I approached her about it, she said, well, you know, we share a cityscape. It's going to be similar. <laughs> this college land is some skin job hallucination. Bright lights and whitewashed shite. See, Glasgow swallowed the red pill and she'll cough it up come Sunday. I threaded floorboards last night. I counted ceiling stars a twinkling in the ballroom night. I shared a roller disco with rock gods and serial killers alike. Washed it down to rebel tunes in our dying marketplace. Head held high, I think of her and how she said we shared this cityscape. But she writes about Mark Twain and I write about life, mate. She chose to be here when all I can do is stay. Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm Victoria McNulty. Uh, this last poem is called Coffin from Derry. A thousand flood could have burst the banks of the Clyde each day in 1848, had it no been of people. The undead sailed in coffins from Derry. Irish fever spilled for the foil to boil the banks with typhoid and the young scratched with fleas for starving rats to be sacked and abandoned in Scotland's slums. And they were feared and they were greeted by no one. When my family arrived in Glasgow, they didn't flee famine but civil war. Their geltach was already back black with Angorta Moor. Their names were warning signs on windows. Then no work or trade gave way to forgotten faiths and altered names and just tags a tarrier, terrorist, and tag. But coffins are no made of mahogany today. They're tarpaulin and waves, no Kilkenny's mass graves, but the beds of the Aegean Sea. The road from Damascus stacked with similarities even Saul could see. Flotsam children lined beaches, their flesh all bloated and grey with typhus. Their parents' skeleton faces lined security gates and fences with wires poked with frail famine hands and lips stitched and stomach pitted as Joe McDonnell or Bobby Sands. Then they want me to say that they're not like us, that they don't belong like us. Well, I can never forget that my Scotland is cut from refugees and how oh, I'm privileged because my sisters made their journeys for me as a child. I watched for couch and TV, miles for pipe bombs and peace walls, and I will not fall silent. I'll stand tall, and I'll stand proud, and I'll stand in solidarity with the displaced peoples now residing in Scotland. Thank you. Victoria, that was absolutely awesome. Absolutely, absolutely. Can I just say that if you ever have a smack down with another poet who you think has been writing poetry in tribute or inspired by yours, I want to buy tickets to see that fight. Because quite frankly, Hen, I think you'll have them on the flair. And the other joyous thing is just listening to the Scots language in such full flow, such use of, of our language. When I was a wee girl, uh, we were moving up in the world, and we were not supposed to speak like that anymore. So words like lug were out. And when I was a wee girl, and we moved to that posh house that we lived in, I told my mummy that I was feared. And she smacked me out of the head and she said, you're no feared, you're scared. And that is how I realised that, in fact, we were aspiring to become middle class. And our next guest, really, she's been to a cocktail party. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, I mean, I'm, I'm going to have to tell her, so have I, but to clean up after it, right? I was, I was the one with the hoover. And, in fact, I'm not sure, I was the one that had the tray of sandwiches sellotaped to my head so that I could just walk about to make people get a wee canapé and that. She's... She, She's looking at me, isn't she? Yeah, I'm quite scared now, because she's considerably taller than I am. She's also incredibly funny, and she is George o. Sutherland! Sutherland! 
I haven't been to a cocktail party tonight, sadly. And also, I think you brought me here on false pretenses, Susan, because you said it was a mayday. I genuinely was like, I thought it was like, mayday, 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 I fucking need help. I, why? I didn't realise we, we were celebrating mayday. Um, I do need help, and I'll tell you why. And you can help me 100% uh, because I've taken a job as a delivery driver for a takeaway uh, shop since, since lockdown happened. And I need you to understand something. There are going to be rules. I mean, you're used to rules now. We've had rules for the last year. We've had rules forever. But you need to understand something. If you order a takeaway, there are three rules. One, you have to have a number on your fucking door. Okay, that's rule number one. Perfectly simple, you'd think. Number two, if you order a takeaway, then I come to the door with your takeaway, then you should answer the fucking door. <laughs> that's rule number two. Rule number three, and this is the most important rule about if you order a takeaway, do not then eventually open the door in your fucking underpants. There seems to be, honestly, there's an indescribable amount of people who order a takeaway and open the door either in their dressing gown, their pyjamas, or their underpants. And I don't know if that was a behaviour that has now come about since lockdown. People have just let themselves go. Or if that happened before. I don't know. I didn't used to be a delivery-taking driver, whatever it is called. <laughs> and <laughs> it's... It seems to be extreme behaviours. Either people are at home in their underpants ordering takeaways, or they're out on their bike, there's a ludicrous amount of lycra, and it's not acceptable. It isn't, there's too many bulging balls and muddy arses for my liking. And it is, it's like extreme behaviours. It's a bit like opinions. There's nothing in the middle. Either we're all getting pissed in the house, I say we because I'm not out on a bike, I can tell you that for nothing. I <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine me on a bike? Oh my God, the beer would spill. And <laughs> and I just and it is it's kind of, it is it's, it's kind of very. And the other thing that I find as well is the amount of blocks of flats that I go to deliver takeaways. I genuinely don't think I'm fit to drive when I get back in the car because the smell of weed is unbelievable. <laughs> I'm literally I'm taking people's dinner to them and then coming out just like oh gosh that was quite enjoyable. <laughs> 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 so yes, so that is, that, that's I'm just telling you, because we are we're used to rules now, so you can get down with them. We need, we need permission for everything now. I mean, you know, all the things, you know, wear a mask, don't wear a mask, do whatever you do. Blah, 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 blah. And the thing that's really driving me mad, all this kind of, you know, permission to do anything. Permission to say or do or behave in a certain way. I'm like, oh my God. I think I don't want to listen to permission anymore. I'm, get, I'm getting to this stage, right? I'm getting quite bold. Um, I need permission from my children just to kind of speak now. I'm not allowed to use the remote control. I'm not, I'm genuinely, I've been told, you're not, you're not allowed to do anything, you're not anything, you're not allowed to be anything. I'm like, oh my God. And because my daughter now, she's gone um, completely. I mean, completely bonkers. Uh, she's <laughs> she's been so fucking rude to me. I have. I know she doesn't mean it, but I mean, well, she might have a point. I have completely, um, well, I think everyone's done this, had a bit of a clear out, do you know what I mean? Tidied everything up. You know, the house was a mess and got into all the cupboards and got everything cleared away. And I have, I've got rid of two children and a husband. Um, so, <laughs> Honestly, the house is so much tidier. Um, it is, it's just, it's like a proper little clear out. And then what, what I have done though is I've moved a couple of comics in by mistake. I don't know how that happened. And then, I, you know, I'm just surrounded by comics and, and my daughter said to me, you've turned our home into a fucking hostel, which it is, I, you know, a little bit like that. Um, so she doesn't come home anymore. Uh, so that's worked out well. But what's happened... <laughs> I seem to have kind of miraculously made my life work quite well. And uh, <laughs> I was talking to them on Zoom now because we don't see each other in person. And you know, that thing sometimes I was talking to them. You talk about stuff that you'd forgotten had happened. And uh, I was on the conversation with a couple of my daughters and my daughter's boyfriend. And I was saying, oh, God, remember that time I lost you? And because, uh, you know, you lose your kids occasionally. Um, I know you're not meant to, but you do. And... <laughs> You know, I know you just just throw in it sometimes. Um, but I remember I was on Princess Street and my kids, I thought, had got on a bus and I hadn't. Um, and 
And you go, oh shit, I think they got on that bus and I wasn't on the bus and I went into this blind panic and I was, oh my God. And eventually I found that they hadn't got on the bus and that they just sort of found their way into Waverley Market and they were on, <laughs> they were in the company of police getting juice and crisps. So then they did that forever. They used to get themselves lost because there was a real result to it. And, <laughs> And I was telling this story to my kids and my daughter's boyfriend, who just was, you know when someone is so shocked and you just think, it's not just me, I'm not the only parent just to have lost my kid occasionally. And he was like, There's, no, that is weird. I was like, it's not, it's not weird, it happens to parents all the time. And he's like, no, it is, it's absolutely weird. You know, that, that's really irresponsible. I was like, it's not irresponsible, it happens to parents all the time. I was like, I bet you your mum lost you. And he's like, of course she didn't, don't be absolutely ridiculous. Nobody, nobody, yeah, if I'd been lost, I'd have known about it. And I was like, you must have been lost. And he was like, mum, and he called his mum over and said, have have you ever lost me? And she went, well, there was this one time. <laughs> I was like, yay! It's what we do, is we just lose our children. Um, they always find their way back, though. That's the disappointing part. And then, because the other thing that's happened, so I've lost my children, I've lost my husband, and my cat's cheating on me. And I haven't got that the wrong way around. The cat's cheating on me, not my husband. And do you know when you get into a row with someone that you don't particularly know, but my, my neighbor has essentially taken my cat and he calls him Hamish and his name's Junior. And then he just feeds him and sends me pictures. It's like, have I, I don't know if I'm being gaslit by my neighbor until I find out that my cat's got a sore ear, in which case um, I have to take him to the vet because when he has to go to the vet, he's my cat. Um, and 172 pounds later, and the question that it might actually have to have, the cat might have to have his ear off. And I was just like, God, I mean, if he has his ear amputated, what's that going to cost me? A fucking arm and a leg. And that is a shit joke, and I do apologize. <laughs> <laughs> you can't have it always. But it is, but I, the one thing, I was talking to Susan about this actually, the one thing that's really pissed me off during lockdown is people's behavior in terms of scams. That has just, we've been littered with people really trying to rip people off in the worst time of our lives that you get phone calls. Has anybody else been getting the phone calls? Do you get, isn't it? And literally you're just going, are you serious? And I get into, I know it's a scam, but you don't quite know it's a scam, do you? You kind of, you get the phone call and they say they're from BT. And, and you listen, you go, it's a recorded message saying, uh, we're phoning you from BT, there is some suspicious activity on your account and we are going to cancel your phone line and your internet. And you suddenly go into this complete panic and then realize you're not with BT, so it can't be. <laughs> Yeah, oh my God, they go, oh no, I'm not with BT. But this one actually did say they were from Sky and said, you know, we're phoning from Sky, there's suspicious activity on your account and we're going to cut off your phone line and your internet. Um, in order to not have this happen, press one to speak to an executive. And you go, oh, yeah, no, it's a scam because they never get to that bit. They always get to that bit where they're quite believable until they say something ridiculous like speak to an executive. And I was telling this to Susan, she said, you know, oh yeah, BT executive, she said she used to work for BT and she couldn't even speak to an executive when she worked for them, so <laughs> the idea that they would be able to, um, yeah, it's just, and uh, yeah, so if you're a scammer, fucking stop it, life's hard enough. Fucking arseholes. So, um, and and two, and I really genuinely mean it about uh, takeaways. Um, stop doing, stop doing that. Stop ordering takeaways if you're not going to be in. Um, <laughs> it's crazy, but do keep drinking. Um, do, no, no, do because that's the other thing. The difference in behaviours. People have got all fit and healthy, but um, you know we we've stopped asking. You know we used to do that thing about you know you want to have a drink and they go oh you know I can't have a drink. It's not five o'clock here. And then someone go oh but it's five o'clock somewhere, and you know you would get permission to drink at five o'clock. And you just think sod it. You know the only two times you're allowed to drink at ridiculous times are at Christmas and uh, on, an, on a flight. If you're 36,000 feet above Kazakhstan, you can drink at four o'clock in the morning, it's fine. And, but I just think now after lockdown, drink, whatever time of day, doesn't matter. Eight o'clock in the morning, have a drink. Four o'clock in the afternoon, have a line, I don't care. <laughs>
You fucking enjoy yourselves. Happy May Day. Oh. It's, it's so lovely to see Jojo in the flesh again after she delivered that takeaway to my front door last night. <laughs> and, you know, those pants were clean on three weeks ago. So I <laughs> don't know what she's complaining about, quite frankly. But do remember the next time somebody goes, ding, no, you're there. Need be nice. It could be Jojo. And just let me tell you, don't annoy her. <laughs> Because, you know, you could wind up wearing your takeaway, is, is what I'm saying. I really did work for BT. We didn't have executives. I wasn't allowed to speak to them at all. They were way above my pay scale. But what I thought was really entertaining was they couldn't operate the lift. So any, which seems to anybody over £50,000 a year can't operate a lift, which I thought was fine. So, moving on. You've heard from them once. You've heard from them twice. We're going to hear from them one last fabulous time. Ladies and gentlemen, it is the fabulous, the wonderful Callum Baird. <laughs> again folks and for the last time this evening here's another song from me and um, Susan reminded us at the beginning that there is an election I've forgotten about the election because um, there's a dearth of things to actually vote for this time around so kind of put it to the back of my mind and got on with life um, but I've been I've been doing a few online gigs throughout the pandemic period and I've always been asked to play this song and I'm going to play it tonight for you. So I hope you enjoy it. And um, any complaints can be made to Mr. Stephen Wright of Fair Play. Thank you very much. <laughs> I was listening to the news the other day I heard a smug politician who had the nerve to say That they were proud to be Scottish, by the way With the glories of a past to remember Here's the us was like us, listen to the cry No surrender to the truth, and here's the reason why The power and the glories, just another bloody lie They use to keep us all in line for there's no gods and there's precious few heroes But there's plenty on the dole in the land of the weary. And it's time now to sweep the future clear Of the lies of the past that we know is never real So farewell to the heather in the glen They cleared us off once and they do it all again For they still prefer sheep to thinking men Ah, but men who think like sheep are even better There's nothing much to lose between the old laird and the new They still don't give a damn for the likes of me and you So just mind and pay your rent to the factor when it's due And mind your bloody manners when you pay for there's no gods and there's precious few heroes But there's plenty on the dole in the land of the view And it's time now to sweep the future clear Of the lies of the past that we know was never real Ah, oh, tell me, will we never hear the end? Of peer bloody Charlie at Culloden yet again Oh he ran like a rabbit down the glen and Even better folk than him to be butchered Or are you in your help to buy house Dreaming of your clan Waiting for the Jacobites to come and free the land Try going down the brew With your claymore in your hand And counting all the princes in the queue For there's no gods And there's precious few heroes but there's plenty on the dole in the land of the view. And it's time now to sweep the future clear Of the lies of the past that we know was never real So don't talk to me of Scotland the brave For if we don't fight now there'll be nothing left to save 
Would you rather stand and watch them dig your grave As you wait for the tartan messiah They'll lead you to the promised land With laughter in their eye We'll all live on the oil And the whiskey by and by Free heavy beer Pie suppers in the sky Where we never have the sense to learn That there's no gods And there's precious few heroes But there's plenty on the dole In the land of the view And it's time now To sweep the future clear Of the lies of the past That we know Oh, there's no gods. Cheers. Thank you, Connie. What a fantastic way to end our fabulous show this evening. The fabulous Callum Beard, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, and indeed, yes, that is um, that is the end of our fabulous May Day company. A fantastic thank you to Coatbridge Construction and West of Scotland Community Branch, the two fabulous branches of Unite the Union who brought this fantastic evening to you. Let's hear it for them out there. Well, out. And of course, a warm thank you for our fabulous performers this evening. Let's go for Victoria, for Callum, for Jojo, and for Vladimir. Yay. Yay. And. Just so that we like embarrassing them, the fabulous people that work here at the Stan Comedy Club, and Al, who's the technical guy there, who's managed to do everything properly, Fraser Heddy, and the fabulous Ian, thank you so much. And finally, fair play over here. Um, what can I say? Well, anyway, it's been a great evening. <laughs> thank you to them as well. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Enjoy the May Day. I hope you have a lovely time. Stay away from the DIY stores. Wallpaper's a shocking price these days. And uh, hope we see you next year. Bye. Yeah. <laughs>